Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, pronouns he, him, and I run events here at The Strand. Before we launch into a discussion of Ian Milheiser's newest book, The Agenda, How a Republican Supreme Court is Reshaping America, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until, after 94 years, The Strand is a sole survivor, now run by third-generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers, authors like Ian and Erin, we wouldn't be here today, and we are so very appreciative of it. So, tonight we are thrilled to have with us Ian Milheiser for the launch of his newest book, The Agenda, How a Republican Supreme Court is Reshaping America. Ian is a senior correspondent at Vox, where he focuses on the Supreme Court, the Constitution, and the decline of liberal democracy in the United States. He is the author of Injustices, the Supreme Court's History of Com Comforting the Comfortable and Afflicting the Afflicted. And his writings have appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, The Nation, American Prospect, and the Yale Law and Policy Review. He received his JD from Duke University and clerked for Judge Eric L. Clay of the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. He lives in Arlington, Virginia. Joining Ian in conversation is Erin Carmone. Erin is a senior correspondent at New York Magazine and co-author of Notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And so, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ian and Erin to the stage. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Sabir. Hi, Ian. Hey, Erin. How's it going? going okay. Um, it's a treat always when I get to talk to you. Usually it's at legal conferences or waiting in line for a legal speaker. Um, but how wonderful it is that we get to be in conversation about your important and uh, substantive yet witty book. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and Ian and I are colleagues at Voxpedia. Um, so uh, let's get it started. I know I always learn from everything that I read that you write with honestly ferocious speed. <laughs> um, I'm going to start out by asking you uh, a very simple question, and I think that anybody who has registered for this event is wondering the same thing. Um, and I'm going to assume a certain set of shared values here as well. How screwed are we right now? Oof. We're, we're, we're pretty fucked. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, I, right, I it's mean, the internet. We're pretty fucked. Yeah, we, 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 <laughs> we, we can say the F word here. Yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's it's bad. Um, and here is what I'm afraid of. So, you know, most of the, you know, in a democracy, sometimes someone gets elected that you don't like mm -hmm. and you have an election and that's your remedy. And like, you know, I didn't much like Donald Trump, but like we had another election, we have a new guy in and like now we should be able to move in a different direction. And I think one of the things that's so troubling about having such a powerful judiciary and, you know, and the fact that justices retire, like, you know, Trump served one term, he got three picks, you know, Bush and Obama served for two terms and they only got two picks each. So, like, there's a certain randomness to, like, what presidents get picked. It means that some presidents get elected and their policies effectively stretch for 40 years. And other presidents get elected and they spend their presidency beating their head against a wall that the court keeps putting in front of them. And so, you know, I just worried about the fact that we had kind of this fluke president, didn't even win the popular vote, you know, probably wouldn't have been president if it wasn't for like a bunch of, you know, butter emails and, you know, the James Comey speech, you know, like kind of this accidental president who was unpopular throughout his entire term but now his policies are going to shape um, the judiciary for potentially the next 40 years. And, you know, before we get into the specifics, I will say that what makes it especially troubling is that so many of those policies are themselves anti-democratic. You know, I spend a lot of time in the book talking about how the Supreme Court is dismantling the Voting Rights Act, about how they are shifting power around within our government 
in ways that benefit the Republican Party. So, you know, um, Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh are pushing a doctrine that shifts the power to set election policy within a state from Democratic governors in states like Wisconsin and, and, and Michigan and towards gerrymandered Republican legislatures. You know, there are a bunch of powers that like the Environmental Protection Agency has historically had. Um, you know, the Department of Health and Human Services has historically had, you know, the ability to control emissions by power plants, the ability to say that insurance companies have to cover birth control or cancer screenings or pediatric care. Um, and those have typically been the purview of the executive branch. And the Supreme Court, you know, I'll get into more detail about this in a bit is shifting that power to the judiciary, um, which is the one unelected branch. So what I worry about is not just that we're gonna have this continuation of bad policies moving forward, but that the bad policies are themselves destructive to democracy and will make it very, very difficult for, um, you know, for, uh, for the voters to change course. Right, and something that I think is really important that you make very clear in the book is that those levers that they're going to use to undermine the democratic process are relatively obscure or arcane, right? They are not the ones that are going to grab the headlines, um, which I think is a challenge for those of us who write for a broader public about how to make the stakes of this apparent without sort of every day running around like chickens with our heads cut off or getting kind of bogged down in the weeds, kind of finding an appropriate balance of, of just how serious this is, what without kind of making people shut down. Right. Um, so, oh, well, well, so I would, but I want to go back to something that you said, because you said he was an accidental president and perhaps it was a fluke of these three states. But what was not accidental is the sort of broader conservative strategy around the courts. So, I wonder before we get into what's going to happen now, if you could just historically ground it a little bit in terms of why was it that when this horror show of a person was elected that the Republican legal movement was so ready to mobilize and to take advantage of that moment. Gotcha. So, so a few thoughts there. I mean, first of all, um, we're coming out of now really a, a kind of a lost decade for Congress. Um, you know, I mean, from 20, from I guess 2011, when the Republican House came in and took away Obama's ability to legislate, until 2020, when the pandemic really forced, like Congress couldn't do nothing in the face of that. We just didn't have any major legislation passed instead of the tax bill. Um, you know, the, the Supreme Court did a ton of stuff. I can read that some of that off in, 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 in a bit. Um, but we had, like, the legislative branch kind of just ceased to be, like, ceased to function for, for this lost decade. Part of the reason why that happened is because I think that Republicans realized they didn't they don't need Congress. You know, they, they realized that um, they can implement most of what they want to accomplish through the judiciary, provided that they control enough seats. And so Mitch McConnell didn't pass much legislation while Donald Trump was president, but he didn't need to. He just kept confirming judges. Mm -hmm. um, not only did he keep confirming judges, but so. Trump, as I said, has three seats on the Supreme Court. Obama only got two, even though he was president for twice as long. There are now more- And even though there were three vacancies in those terms. Right, no, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm getting to that part. Yeah. You know, there are more Trump judges currently sitting on the US Court of Appeals than there are Obama judges. I believe there are 53 Trump judges currently sitting on the US Court of Appeals, which is one step down from the Supreme Court. And there's, I think, only 50 or 51 Obama judges. And the reason for that is, is just what you said. For the last two years of Obama's presidency, Mitch McConnell basically shut down judicial confirmation. There actually was were two circuit judges that got through, but that's, I mean, Bush got 10 or 11 through in his last, in, in, in his last two years as president. And then, of course, there was Merrick Garland. So the reason why Trump had such an outsized impact on the courts, I mean, part of it was that Mitch McConnell was waiting for this moment. But a huge part of it was that Trump effectively got all of to fill all the seats that he should have gotten legitimately in a four year term, plus all the seats that Obama should have gotten to fill in the last two years. And so instead of having a two term president who had 
two terms worth of influence on the judiciary, and then a one-term president who had half as much influence on the judiciary. You wound up having two presidents who had effectively six years worth of impact on the judiciary. And again, the, the reason why they did this is because they understood how powerful the courts are. They understand that if you control who has the right to vote, or if you control gerrymandering, then you know it doesn't really matter who wins elections. They understand if you control who has the power to regulate, then even when there's you know a president of a certain you know that you don't like in power, it's not going to matter. You know they understand that courts. You know I have a whole chapter here about in here about religion and mm-hmm. how like the court keeps on carving out. I mean this is something that you and I have covered for. A, God, a decade now. It's like a Groundhog Day of cases. Yeah, it, it really is, and and they keep getting yeah. worse. Yeah, but but like, there's this idea, you know, like basically what a lot of religious conservatives ask are asking for is that they want to have broad immunity from the law. Like, they, they if they object strongly enough to a law, they don't want to have to follow it. You know, I don't get to do that. You don't get to do that. But if you control the courts, then you can have that. So you, so I just I want to stop you there because I think you know you you do explain this in a book in the book in a way that I think is both satisfying and concise. But here's where I say to you, as if I don't know the answer. Wait a minute. I thought liberals were the judicial activists who were the ones who were policy making through the courts, such as gay marriage and abortion rights, which you know supposedly judicial fiat has created these new rights. Um, Republicans have run successfully for so long on the notion that it is liberals who are thwarting the democratic will. And so I'm wondering, you know, this is again, huge air quotes. Here I'm on videos, I'm gonna do the air quotes. Uh, is it a both sides hypocrisy that that after the Warren court and the, the Berger court enjoying the courts creating policy making uh liberals are now all of a sudden looking for judicial humility and conversely are uh republicans engaged in hypocrisy where the moment that they have gotten into power uh in the judicial branch and maybe you know sometimes getting the presidency but not consistently and sometimes getting congress but not consistently um that now all of a sudden they're fans of policy making through the courts how how do you reconcile what could be perceived um by either side, frankly, as hypocrisy. Yeah. So, I mean, I, it, it is true. I mean, Jack Balkan has a good paper on this. It, it is true that, like, political movements that control the judiciary tend to be more keen on judicial power, and political movements that do not control the judiciary tend to be really keen on judicial restraint. I mean, I, I don't think I need to explain to folks why, why that might be the case. But, you know, that said, so let me just give you, walk you through, like, a quick 100-year history of the Supreme Court. Let's so, hundred. I come years, to you for this. Yep, hundred years ago, we were lived in something called the Lochner era, after a case called Lochner v. New York, where the Supreme Court, often for completely made up reasons, struck down a lot of progressive labor legislation. They actually struck down a federal child labor law, saying that it's unconstitutional for Congress to ban child labor. Um, you, you know, they struck down a lot of laws limiting the number of hours that workers could could work, struck down minimum wage laws. Um, you know, just, you know, the Supreme Court basically set itself up as, you know, sort of the national censors, you know, the, the people who had the power to veto any law they didn't like. And given the politics of who was on the court, they didn't like a lot of labor laws, so they struck it all down. Um, and this came into a head during the Roosevelt years when they started striking down a lot of New Deal policies, you know, some on plausible grounds, some on extraordinarily spurious grounds. And Roosevelt really could have taken this two ways. I, I mean, like, if you go back and you look at what liberal thinkers were saying in the 1930s, you know, there were people who were saying, like, the court should be in the business of protecting unions and like courts should just make up doctrines to protect unions in the same way that these conservative justice have been making up doctrines to protect management. You know, there were people who were saying the court should become an arm of the new deal and, and implement Rooseveltian policies on their own. And Roosevelt, you know, and I think to his credit said, no, like I was elected, I have a mandate and like we, this should be a democracy. And so I want the courts to back off. And that was 
mostly what he wanted from his justices, and he got it. He got, you know, he got the courts to back off. Um, they didn't back off completely. So one of the mo- like, I, I mean, I think actually the most important decision of the 21st or of the 20th century, even more significant than Brown, was a case called Caroline Products. And what Caroline Products said is that in almost all cases, we want democracy to set the rules. So in almost all cases, courts should defer to the, legis- to, to the legislature and where necessary, the executive. But there are some exceptions. You know, one is when there's an explicit constitutional right. So like the First Amendment is really there. You can't ignore free speech rights. Um, The second is what they referred to as laws that infringe on the rights of discrete and insular minorities. So like if there is a minority group that isn't just, you know, a minority group in the sense that it is small in numbers, but in the sense that it is systematically excluded from political power in the way that say African-Americans were in the Jim Crow South, then the courts have a duty to step in. And then the third prong is if the, if the legislature starts messing with the democratic process itself. So like under this gerrymander should be struck down. You know, if if courts, you know, if Democrats get into power and they pass a law saying that you can't vote unless you, you know, I don't know, what's an, what's a piece of pop culture that Democrats, you, you know, you know, unless you can recite the lyrics to the to the latest Little Nas X song, you know, something that's that's intended <laughs> to disenfranchise Republicans, like that should be struck down. Um, but for the most part, we just want democracy to be the rule. So we want democracy to be the rule unless it is tyrannical unless, against oppressed minorities, such as women seeking abortions or other people seeking abortions or people seeking to marry someone of the same sex. Right. And so that's the question is like, there are indeed marginal cases in this framework. I mean, I actually don't think that marriage equality is, is a particularly marginal case. I think that, you know, the, the, in the law, in the language of the law, um, sexual orientation is what is called, should be classified as what is called a quasi suspect class, which means that like, you know, People who are gay, people who are trans, people who are bi have historically been subject to the kind of discrimination where they are a minority and their yeah. minority status. No, precisely, yeah. precisely yeah. what you just laid out, Caroline Products. Yeah. So, so you, I, I hear you saying that it's it's not actually hypocrisy on our side, which I like, of course. I mean, but or it's, at least it's reconcilable. So, what happened on the conservative side? with respect to the courts, is it purely political? And something that I think that you do really well in, in the in the book is that you lay out how all of the conservatives on the court are not ideologically homogenous, right? right. Each one of them has different approaches. I think it's something that um, sort of broad strokes liberal commentary on the court tends to elide, uh, which, is, which helps us understand some of the surprising outcomes that all of the conservatives are different. So I wonder, could you combine your answers to say like, Okay, so uh, how did we get to this point where the conservatives uh, on the court really want to undermine the democratic process? And do they want to do it in different ways? Or do some of them want to do it more than others? Yeah, so first, I mean, let me let me just like talk about what your point about you made about how they aren't ideologically homogenous. Mm-hmm. Because like that actually is really important when you think about, you know, if you only have five justices, that means you have to get all five to get the outcome that you want. And so, like Roberts goes all you, you you know goes in an unexpected direction, and we get to keep Obamacare, or like you know I mean I don't know if this is actually the case anymore because it just Justice Barrett just hasn't been there long enough for me to have a sense of where she stands on criminal justice. But before Justice Ginsburg died, I think the Supreme Court we had before Justice Ginsburg's death was further to the left on criminal justice than any court we've had for the previous twenty or thirty years. And the reason for that wasn't because it was a liberal court. It was because you had four liberals and Roberts on Fourth Amendment issues, especially when technology was involved, he was just really sketched out by what cops could do to spy on you through your cell phone and stuff like that. So he tended to vote with the liberals on those issues. Mm -hmm. Kavanaugh actually has surprisingly progressive views on race and criminal justice. He, He wrote his law review note. On jury on racial jury discrimination, and so on racial questions, you get the four liberals plus Kavanaugh. Gorsuch has kind of idiosyncratic views on like jury trials and like right to counsel, Sixth Amendment issues. Sometimes you could get Gorsuch, and, and so like you know because 
when you only have five votes, if any one of them has an unusual view on one issue, you could sometimes peel them off. That matters. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, I think there's a real generational divide within conservatism. Mm -hmm. So, like, I talked about this Caroline Products framework, and this wasn't just the way that liberals thought. I mean, this was really the way that every serious legal thinker thought until fairly recently. I, I, I mean, like, if you go back, you, look, you read what Nixon had to say about the role of the judiciary. You read what Reagan had to say. Like, they were railing against judicial activism. They were calling for judicial restraint. You mm -hmm. know, Nixon was mad that about, you know, judges who want to impose their values on us. He meant judges that will, like, protect people who are criminal defendants. But, like, Nixon wanted the courts to do less. Reagan wanted the courts to do less. Even George W. Bush wanted the courts to do less. And I think the thing that Nixon and Reagan in particular had in common with Roosevelt is that they were confident about their willing ability to win in a democracy. Like they they mm -hmm. won by strong margins, at least, you know, Nixon at least the second time around. Like, you know, they felt comfortable that like their political movement could win in the democratic process. And so why would you have this other branch of government interfering with them? I think that a big reason why you've seen Republicans trend towards judicial power is, look, Democrats have won seven of the last eight um, um, presidential elections, if you just look at the popular vote. The only reason they are able to confirm judges at all is because of Senate malapportionment. If it wasn't for Senate malapportionment, there would have been unbroken Democratic control of the Senate, I think stretching back to like the mid-90s. Um, and so when you are less confident about your ability to win, you know, you, you know, that the people are behind you, you start to look for other ways to, to get your way. And then there's one other thing that's in play here, which is that the courts have been getting more and more conservative for basically our entire lifetimes, you know, ever since Nixon was elected, with the possible exception of Justice Ginsburg. I think every single person who's been nominated to the court um, during that period, and, you know, with the possible exception of Ginsburg and maybe Sotomayor, every single person who's been appointed to the court has been further to the right than the person they replaced. And yeah. at some points have been much further to the right. I mean, think of replacing Thurgood Marshall with Clarence Thomas or Ruth Bader Ginsburg with Amy Coney Barrett. Yeah, I mean, Kagan and, well, maybe it depends on if it's their entire career or their recent career, but yes, okay, I'm gonna leave that point there because I don't want to get derailed. Right, right. So um, like- so Everything is, but some of those justices have moved to the left later in their lives, supposedly, if you ask conservatives. I mean, su supposedly, but like, I guess what my point is, is like, if you're an 80 year old conservative lawyer, you still remember the day when Roe v. Wade was handed down and it hurt and like it made you feel the pain of when the judiciary does something that you really doesn't like. And that gives you kind of a healthy fear of judicial power. Roberts is, I think, the one remaining bridge to people who still think that way, not because he's 80 years old, he's you know 60 something, but because he sort of apprenticed at the knee of the people who were the big deal lawyers in the Reagan administration. And they sort of inculcated him with certain values of judicial restraint. Um, on the other end of the, ex of the extreme, if you're Neil Gorsuch, Neil Gorsuch has never been mad because the courts, because he thought that the courts did too much. Neil Gorsuch his entire life has only been mad, you know, with the possible exception of the marriage equality decision, but like, I don't think Neil Gorsuch is personally anti-gay. I mean, he wrote the Bostock case. So mm -hmm. like, Neil Gorsuch, every time in his life that he's been mad at the courts, it's because he wanted them to do more. Why didn't you strike down Obamacare? Right, he wanted them to strike down regulations. Yeah, and so if you're a young conservative, and, you know, I mean, Gorsuch is in his 50s, but I, I will call him young by this metric. Your whole life, you could say, do more courts, because, like, you've never been disappointed when the courts have done something that you didn't like. You didn't live through Roe v. Wade. You know, you didn't live through those kinds of decisions. And so I think there's this generational divide where now, and I mean, it's, it's only going to get worse, because now there is no one that a Republican president could nominate who has a healthy fear of judicial power because everyone in the Federalist Society now who's young enough to be a judicial nominee grew up in an age when they wanted the courts to do more and they wanted them to do it now. 
And I also think that after Amy Coney Barrett, if you have somebody with a relatively thin resume who is an open ideological warrior, if that person can get confirmed without anybody worrying, even without the context of Justice Ginsburg's death, I, I also think that there, there was, you know, yes, they lost the presidency, but they have now a, I think Lindsey Graham used the word unabashedly pro-life. They have somebody who has a paper trail to an extent that we would not have seen uh, I think in a time in which they were at least trying to keep up that pretense, right? And right. you have Trump saying, here's my list of justices that will overturn Roe v. Wade. I feel like the, the legacy of the Trump era is they stopped even pretending yeah. uh, that they were interested in judicial humility. Um, Although, but I don't want to, I, I don't, oh, I'm sorry, oh, because good. I see it's already 726. So I don't want to lose sight of the major argument of the book, because right. I think we could just talk about the broader context forever. And I also want to remind everybody listening that they can ask a question with this thing. It's like on my monitor, it's right under me. It says, ask a question. And I'm going to ask your questions to Ian uh, in about 15 minutes. So please get them in there. Um, so even with the um, relative heterogeneity of these justices, there's a kind of Venn diagram that you identify um, of what you believe that they will all agree on. And at least five of them need right. to agree on it, and there's six of them. So there's a very good chance that under the major areas that you laid out, we're going to see sweeping change. Yes. Can you just take us through what we could expect to see now that the conservative fever dreams have come true and they have a 6-3 court? Yep. So I walk in the book, I, I talk about four issues. Um, Voting rights, um, the administrative state, which sounds really arcane and boring, but it's super important. Like questions like whether or not we can have environmental regulation in this country. I will come back to this. Religion and these broader questions of whether religious conservatives should have exemptions from the law. And then I spend a whole chapter on an issue called forced arbitration which is basically a doctrine that's been created by the Supreme Court, which says that when you do business with someone, and often when you are employed by someone, your boss can at any moment send you an email saying, from here on out, if you ever want to sue me, you're not allowed to sue me in a real court. You're not allowed to bring a class action lawsuit. So if you have a common claim with your colleagues, you're not allowed to join together. You have to go to a private arbitration system, which tends to, which is much more likely to rule in favor of corporate parties than real courts, and that awards you less money if you do win. Um, and if you don't agree to give up all these rights and go into this private arbitration system, you're fired. Right. You know, that's what this court said. And a common way, in, a common sphere in which this is used is sexual harassment, for example. Exactly. Racial discrimination, sexual harassment. Yep. So if you, and, and also it's a very secretive process. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you have, you know, if you, if there is someone who has sexually harassed 12 people in an office, you know, it's going to come out if there are real lawsuits because those are public and eventually mm -hmm. someone's going to file a lawsuit and their lawyer is going to start doing research and realize like, holy crap, this guy's already been sued twice. Like, right. you know, it's going to come out. Arbitration is secret. So often these things just don't come out for that reason. Um, but but like rather than doing a deep dive on arbitration, like I, I, I want to start with a deep dive on what's happening in voting rights. Mm -hmm. um, Very relevant like, to this week. Yes. And always. Uh, yes. And like this is, I mean, because if you don't have the right to vote, you don't have anything. Like this is, I think, the single most important issue and the most fright. So first of all, I want to say that if you're talking about voting rights, you have to talk about race. Um, and the reason for that is Democrats in any given election will win between 80 and 90 percent of black voters. They'll win between 60 and 70 percent of Latino voters. Um, you know, Trump actually performed better amongst black and brown voters in 2020 than he did in 2016. But still, like Biden got between 80 and 90 percent of black voters and he got between 60 and 70 percent of Latino voters. And what that means is if you are, say, a Georgia state lawmaker and you want to make sure that Democrats don't vote, you can use race as a proxy to identify who the Democrats are. So, you know, if you close down all the precincts in a black neighborhood or if you eliminate early voting on Sundays because African-American churches tend to do get out the vote drives on Sundays. Um, you know who you're disenfranchising. And so, you know, race 
still matters. I mean, even if it is no longer, you know, even if you no longer see the same ideological commitment to white supremacy that you saw in the Jim Crow era. Race, at least not explicitly. At least not explicitly. You know, race is still, very, yeah, it's still very often used as a proxy to identify like, okay, this is where the Democrats live. So if I disenfranchise the people in this neighborhood, I know Republicans will win this election. Yeah, the, the same- I just wouldn't, the, the, the only thing that I would push back, and I kind of felt this way about the book too, it's not incidental, right? It's not just that they're yeah. trying to find Democrats. They also don't want black people to have political power. Right. I mean, it's not right. like I'm going to pretend to be, they are racist in yeah. doing this, right? I mean, it's not like a coincidence. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I would say to that is like, I don't th- even think you need to get into the question of motivation here. L- l- like, you know, whether they are doing it out of, you know, and I, and I suspect that there's a combination. I suspect that some members of the Georgia legislature are still ideologically committed to white supremacy as a rule. And some of them are just like, well, they told me this is how we make sure that Republicans stay in charge. But like, I don't think you have to get into motivation here because like the facts are mm-hmm. that race is being used as a proxy to identify who to disenfranchise. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, so starting with that, the the safeguard that we have against race discrimination voting is the Voting Rights Act. And the Voting Rights Act basically does three things. Uh, The first is preclearance. If if you live in a state or a local or an area where there's a history of racial voter discrimination, you um, that your local or state government would have to preclear is the term any new voting law with officials in Washington, D.C. And they would just look at it, make sure that it isn't racist, you know, make sure that it isn't going to discriminate on the basis of race. And if it doesn't, then the law can go into effect. Um, The second prong is called the intent test. And the intent test says that if a law is passed with the intent of discriminating on the basis of race in elections, then it should be struck down. Uh, The third requirement is called the results test. And the results test is super complicated. If, you know, if there's any lawyers in the audience who's ever have to apply the Gingles standard, I my condolences. It really is an excessively complex area of the law. But like the bottom line with the results test is that certain laws that have a disparate impact on voters of color that, you know, will disenfranchise more black voters or more Latino voters or more non-white voters than they'll dis- disenfranchise white voters will be struck down. Um, So what's happened to the Voting Rights Act? Well, in Shelby County v. Holder in 2013, the Supreme Court basically got rid of preclearance. I mean, they they didn't strike down preclearance altogether, but they said that the formula that's used to determine who is subject to preclearance no longer exists. And I feel like I need to jump in here and say that that was the Supreme Court opinion that led Justice Ginsburg to be nicknamed the Notorious RBG, yeah. specifically for her observation that getting rid of preclearance was like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Yep. And I will Thank note. You. Yep. And I will note that the Shelby County opinion was written by Chief Justice Roberts, who is now the most moderate member of the Republican majority on the Supreme Court. So we now have five justices who are further to the right than the guy who got rid of preclearance. Right. Um, the se- so the second problem was the intent test. Um, in a case called Abbott v. Perez, the Supreme Court basically applied such a high presumption of white racial innocence that it is almost impossible to win in the intent test. Now, the burden of proof on plaintiffs who are trying to prove intentional race discrimination after Abbott is so high that it is almost insurmountable, like unless you could show that like the lawmakers burned a cross or something while they were voting on the bill. It is, it is just very, very hard to clear that bar. Um, and then there's a third case that was actually argued at the beginning of this month called Burnovich, which attacks the results test. You know, Roberts, and again, Roberts is the most moderate member of the court's six justice Republican majority, fought tooth and nail to try to kill the results test. To his credit, it was Ronald Reagan who signed the bill that wrote the right results test into the vote. Yeah, and I, I just want to, I, I just want to like kind of bullet point that this is what is left of the teeth of the Voting Rights Act, right? right. This is what is left after the majority of the Supreme Court in a five four decision guts the Voting Rights Act. Now we have section two, it's hanging by a thread. Right. And so it's likely, I mean, I don't know if they're going to do it in this Bernovich case. They might do it a few cuts at a time, but it's likely that the Supreme Court's going to get rid of the results test too. And if you don't have preclearance and you don't have the intent test, 
and you don't have the results test, then you don't have a Voting Rights Act. You don't have safeguards against racist voting laws. And you're not just going to see what we're seeing now in Georgia. You're going to see that on steroids. You know, you, you, you're going to see, you, you know, I mean, you're already seeing examples of like, if you're white and you're in a white suburb in Atlanta, you want to go vote, you walk in, 15 minutes later, you're out. If you're black and you live in the heart of Atlanta, you wait six hours. And we could see that in every state if, 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 if you don't have a Voting Rights Act. Um, no, I, I discuss other things in here that the court is going to do to our voting rights. There's this thing called the independent state legislature doctrine, which it, I, I, it remains to be seen how strong that they're going to make it. But in its strongest form, it would strip governors of their ability to veto election laws and it would strip state Supreme Courts of their power or really state judiciaries in their entirety of their power to strike down state election laws or to enforce state constitutional provisions protecting the right to vote. So in these states with gerrymandered legislatures, like right, this, and also and also undermine referenda, right? Right. I mean, yes, if, and also if there are referenda that say that they want to have an independent redistricting commission, for example. Yeah, like that would be struck down. So yeah. you have states like Wisconsin and Michigan, um, and Pennsylvania, where the legislature is so thoroughly gerrymandered that you know you 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 can't elect a Democratic legislature, and now the governor can't veto the bill. Um, that draws the congressional lines. So you're going to have congress. You're going to have congressional lines drawn, so that it's almost impossible for Democrats to win the U.S. House. Um, so you know, I could keep going here, but the picture that I paint in the book, and I and I don't think it's it's inaccurate, is is that the court is chipping away at our voting rights. And I guess I, I'll make one other point. They're chipping away just enough because like if you've heard everything I've said and you aren't scared by it, I guess the thing I would say to frighten you is that <laughs> the Democratic majority in the House is hanging by a thread right now. We have a 50-50 Senate. If something like 45,000 voters in Georgia, Wisconsin, and Arizona had voted differently or just not shown up, in 2020, Donald Trump would still be president right now. So, like, if or I mean, or if one of these uh, senators in a purple state dies, yeah, no, there, and we won't be able to confirm any judges to right, yeah. So there's all like I mean, exist still. There are all kinds of ways that this is hanging on a thread. So, like, I think what the Supreme Court is doing is calamitous and and could lead to massive shifts in who's able to win our elections. But I could be wrong about that. And even if I'm wrong, it doesn't have to be a massive shift. You know, again, if the Supreme Court had succeeded in disenfranchising just a tiny, tiny fraction of voters in three states, Donald Trump would be in the right White House right now. Right. And I, I mean, I think that you're also making the argument implicitly, and you, you say it explicitly in the book, is that this kind of death of a thousand cuts is also designed to be subtle. Right. I think that there's, you know, I don't want to get into it too much because I'm, I'm looking at the questions and they're really spectacular and I want to get into them. Um, but you wrote about the the abortion case that was taken up and and I'm not going to actually let you answer this because I want to ask people's questions. But just to say that you should read Ian's piece in Vox in which he lays out, for example, a way in which uh, the court can undermine abortion is to do so in the most technical and boring way possible such that because what 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 action what levers do we have we have po still public pressure political pressure and so on um but if people don't know what's happening it's that much easier to mute any kind of reaction or public mobilization um okay so this is uh this is a question i was going to ask but uh taber benedict has asked it in a wonderful way so i'm going to take this question um how effective or impactful will the nominations made over the next two years or perhaps more if Biden gets it, um, or if Democrats get it, uh, be at reversing the damage done during the Trump years. And so more broadly, like what can be done to reverse this doomsday scenario that you've had to sketch out here? So, so it, it matters a lot who Biden gets to replace. I, I, I mean, like if Justice Thomas decides to go pursue his dreams on Broadway tomorrow, like that would be really significant if Biden got to replace Thomas. You know, if, if Justice Alito was lost at sea, like th th that's going to be really significant. If, um, you know, if what is more likely he gets to replace Justice Breyer, 
I mean, we'll, we'll get probably a younger version of Justice Breyer, but like, you know. What about what about the lower courts? On the lower courts, so that that's a really good question. So part of what scares me about the lower courts is that you've got a lot of these Trump appointed district judges who are functioning like a think tank for terrible ideas that they're feeding up to the Supreme Court. So like, I'll give you an example. Um, the Constitution has a provision saying Congress can regulate commerce amongst the several states. And the, the way that the Supreme Court has interpreted that is they have said commerce, normally that means economic regulation. So when the Supreme when Congress regulates the economy, generally those laws will be upheld. For non-economic regulations, if Congress is regulating something other than the economy, um, then like those laws are more likely to be struck down. And so there's a, there was a federal um, eviction moratorium in place. And there's a number of plausible legal attacks that could be made on this eviction moratorium. But there's a Trump, Trump judge in Texas, and the attack that he made is he said that evicting someone from a home that they pay money in order to rent is not economic activity non-economic to it to 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 evict someone from the home that they're paying thousands of dollars a year to live in and therefore congress couldn't create pass a law that allowed this eviction moratorium to exist because evictions are not economic no it's insane it's, yeah um, but so you're worried about those kind of bubbling up to the supreme court but what about but i want to i want to get you back to what is possible to accomplish and i'm going to also um ask a follow-up question that's getting a lot of votes right now from Julie, now that we're scared about this, what do we do to solve this problem? Expand the courts is is a is one suggestion that she has. But again, so what can Biden do, and what can those tuning in tonight do besides like tear our hair out? So let me give you the case for optimism, and the case for optimism, at least for the next two years, has very little to do with the courts. So like. Part of the reason why Democrats are in a hole right now is because they have a very electorally inefficient coalition. Like, you know, you know, like white people in like rural Michigan just have more power in our system than like a Latino voter in L.A. Um, because of the Electoral College and because of the Senate and, and, and so on and so forth. And when you look at the polls um, on economic policy, there's about a 70-30 split. I mean, we really are a center-left country on economic policy. Um, and, you know, 70% of the country prefers what Democrats want to do there. Um, on cultural issues, and by cultural issues, I don't mean like necessarily abortion, although abortion, I guess, is part of that. But like, you know, questions about like, do I like what's on my TV? Do I like that there are people in the streets that are saying mean things about cops when I like cops? Um, you know, stuff like that. Um, there we really are split 50-50 and Republicans might even have a slight advantage. And so if elections are fought on economic grounds, left parties will tend to win. If, if, if they're fought on cultural grounds, it's more of a toss up. And so let me be clear about what I'm not arguing here. I'm not arguing that we throw the cultural politics under the bus and like just give Republicans what, what they want on that. That's a terrible idea. What I am arguing though, is that the more that voters realize they have something to gain from the economic policies that Democrats are pushing, the more likely they're going to vote for Democrats, even if they don't like the cultural politics of the Democratic Party. And so passing a nearly $2 trillion stimulus bill that's going to help a lot of people and a lot of people who voted for Donald Trump is a really great way to get people to realize that they should vote for Democrats. So you're saying that it perhaps Democrats could become more politically popular so that 45,000 votes here and there through voter suppression won't be as big of an impact. It, exactly. Biden has to rearrange the coalitions. And again, he shouldn't do this by throwing anyone under the bus, but there are, you know, he is pushing policies now that help the overwhelming majority of, of, of the country. And so if those coalitions get rearranged, you know, I think that expanding the court is warranted, given what happened with Merrick Garland and with Amy Coney Barrett. But Democrats don't have the votes for it. I mean, I, I just don't see Man Mansion and Cinema letting it happen. Right. No, but, I think that dream died with the, the Senate elections. Yeah. 
Yeah, but if you know, if, if Biden is able to to like rearrange the coalitions to such a degree that Democrats actually gain seat, keep the House and gain seats in the Senate, so maybe there's 52 or 53 Democratic senators in two years, then you can talk about things like court expansion. Well, and so on that point, we do have a question from Michael, which has two votes. Um, and it, I guess I'm gonna frame this as asking you, were there the votes, would you support for example, um, Michael suggests term limits on justices or lower court judges. Is there a feasible pathway to doing it without a constitutional amendment? Is there a feasible means to get a condition, maybe constitutional amendment? Um, so I think I think one way to think about this is if the politics were not in it, the current politics were not an impediment, and we had the reality that you just laid out. What kinds of structural reforms, including term limits, would you support? So I mean, term limits, I think, are an interesting idea. I don't think that the Constitution would allow you to impose term limits, absent an amendment, on a sitting judge. So the Constitution says that a judge shall hold their office for life. And so like the office that Neil Gorsuch has is that he gets to be an associate justice for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. I do think that you could impose term limits on new justices. So like judges are moved around in the court system all the time. Like, you know, when I clerked on a U.S. Court of Appeals, we would frequently have judges sit by designation from other courts. Sometimes they were trial judges. Occasionally you'd have a retired justice come and sit on the Court of Appeals by designation. So for a new judge, you could change the nature of their office. You could say, new justice, the office that you are getting is that you get 18 years that you will sit on the panel that is the Supreme Court, and then you will get the rest of your career where you will do something else. Um, you, you could do that prospectively. I don't think that solves the problem we have right now. The other thing that worries me about term limits is that, you know, and I sort of alluded this to this earlier, I think that Republicans... Republican judges are have, are becoming more and more radical with each passing year. You know, Trump's judges were well to the right of George W. Bush's judges, who were well to the right of Reagan and George H. W. Bush's judges. And and I don't see anything that's going to break this cycle. So like, I I think that term limits are you know do you really want to replace someone like John Roberts with someone like Brett Kavanaugh? Like I I don't think that that I don't think that improves things. Yeah, um, or so, even Coney Barrett, I would say, because I think Kavanaugh seems like a little Roberts mini. I mean, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Um, but anyway, so I don't think that term limits, I mean, they, they may solve the problem of like judges staying into their dotage. Um, you know, I mean, there may be problems that term limits do solve, but I don't think that they solve the problem that we're discussing, which is an ideologically extreme court. Um, you know, what do you think it does? So, I mean, well, the, the, the nuclear weapon you can drop is court packing. So the Constitution says there is a Supreme Court. It doesn't say how many justices shall sit on the Supreme Court. And so, you know, Congress could pass a law tomorrow if it had the vote saying there's now going to be 15 seats. And, oh, look, there's six vacancies. I guess Biden gets to fill them. Um, you, you know, that, that's something that could happen if Congress had the votes. Um, the problem with that is that if you do that, I don't think that you just get your dream liberal judiciary. What happens is that you destroy the credibility of the judiciary. So I tend to so think- So it doesn't sound like you're endorsing any of these options. Well, let, let, let me get there. Um, I think that I hope, like, the reason why I described court packing as kind of the, as kind of the, 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 well, as the nuclear option, even though that term is somewhat overused, is the purpose of a nuclear weapon is you never use it. You know, like the, the reason why the United States has a nuclear arsenal is so that, you know, it used to be the Soviets, but like whoever else also has nuclear weapons won't send them at us because they know that we'll send ours their way if, if they do. Like the purpose of it is deterrence. And so if the Supreme Court believed that there was a credible threat of court packing, I, you know, and to some extent, I mean, I think that might explain why they haven't taken an abortion case yet. Maybe they're, maybe they are afraid. I mean, I think it exp it explains the last term. Yeah, you know, many of the surprises, for example, June Medical not overturning the abortion precedent, um, the LGBT case, maybe the census case. Yeah, like I mean, I think like you know, we may you know, there this might this deterrent effect may actually be happening right now. Um, so I think that that can help. 
And then the the other thing that I would say, so like there's a study that I discuss in here by Rick Hassett, um, who's a law professor out in California. So like if you go back to like, I think 1975 and through 1990 is the period he looks at. And every two year congressional term, Congress would overturn about a dozen Supreme Court decisions. So they would pass about a dozen laws that in some way changed the law as the Supreme Court made it. Um, and then, you know, he look, I think the most recent period he looks at is like 2000 to 2012. And during that period, Congress would overturn about 2.7 Supreme Court decisions every, during every two year, during every two year congressional term. So Congress is now 80 percent less likely to tell the Supreme Court, you guys goofed than right. it used to be. And I think that that fosters a sense of impunity. Like, you know, I, I like I talked about this judicially created problem of forced arbitration in there. It's entirely statutory. It's all about the court mangling its interpretation of a law called the Federal Arbitration Act. Congress can amend the Federal Arbitration Act tomorrow. Right. Well, maybe maybe we're entering an era of more functional Congress. You know, I mean, yeah, it's no, certainly doing things right now. Yeah. No. And so maybe I mean, you know, and I mean, there's I, you know, I've spoken to senators who are starting to think about, like, you know, do we need an omnibus bill that just overrules all the bad court decisions from the last thirty well, that's years? That's interesting. Yeah, you, you know, but you know, do do we do it? A, you know, there actually was an omnibus bill. There was the Civil Rights Act of nineteen ninety one, which was a law like the Supreme Court handed down. I think it was like maybe five or six bad civil rights decisions, and Congress went, "Nope, all those are overruled. Everything that you said, you're going to do the opposite now." You know, there, there was there, there's the ADA Amendments Act of 2008. Right, but you can only do that on statutory mess ups, right? right? You can't do that on errors of, of constitutional interpretation. I want to make sure to get to one more question. We have a lot of really good ones, but we only have seven minutes. And so here is the top voted question right now. What does the future of Second Amendment rulings look like with this court? Will oh, yeah. SCOTUS acknowledge the social fallout with guns in America? A sadly perennially relevant question. God, yeah. this is this. The future is so grim. So first of all, like it's already almost as bad as it could possibly be, and the reason why is that in the Heller decision, I mean, the Heller does have some language since there can be some, there could be regulation on what's called dangerous and unusual weapons, for example. There could still be background checks. You could still exclude people with felony convictions and people with certain mental illnesses from getting firearms. So Heller allows some restrictions on guns. But the one thing that Heller says is it says that handguns are special. You can't ban handguns. 80% of gun murders are committed by a handgun. You, you, you know, I mean, we, there's a lot of press attention when there's, a, um, when there's a mass shooting, but mass shootings are actually, you know, a very tiny portion of, of, of the, the, the gun deaths in this country. You know, 40% of murders, in, of gun murders in the United States, the motive is an argument. Two guys are in a bar, it would have been a fist fight, but one of them has a handgun. Mm -hmm. And, you know, no one knew he had a handgun because you can conceal it. And so what would have been a fist fight becomes a murder, you know, or like spouses are arguing and the husband is standing by the dresser where there's a handgun. You, you, you know, I mean, 40 percent of gun murders. That, that's what the story is. The second, like about 20 or 25 percent of gun murders, the second most common motivation is a drug deal gone bad. So again, like there's a drug deal going on. People have a concealed weapon. And Ian, since we only have five minutes left, I want you to get back to SCOTUS. What will they do on this? So, I mean, the handgun ban, like, is already, you know, the, the ban on banning handguns has already happened. I said before that there's, um, Heller said that dangerous and unusual weapons can still be banned. But, you know, like Kavanaugh's written an opinion where he says, look, AR AR 15s are all over the place. Like, you know, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of them in this country. So they aren't unusual. And so I, I think that the Supreme Court is going to say that you can't have an assault rifle ban because I think there are five votes now to say, well, you know, assault rifles are everywhere. They're not unusual. Therefore, people can have them. I think that background checks are probably going to like still be allowed. And that's good. But I don't think it's anywhere near enough because you know again like 
most gun murders are spontaneous. You know, you know, they they they, they aren't you know, or they aren't murders at all. Like actually, I, like I think more than half of gun deaths are suicides. So like you know, I think it's good to prevent people who you can identify as advanced as likely to commit a crime with a gun. It, it's good to prevent them from getting guns, but that's not like I, th- that's not the whole problem. It, it, you know, there's still a, an enormous problem that you just can't address through what the Supreme Court's going to allow to to still be on the table. So, in under the wire, a question from the great Betsy West, uh, co-director of the RBG documentary: If it were passed, would the For the People Act likely be struck down by the SCOTUS? And that I. I want. I wanted to get to this question because I do want to talk about. You know, again, we've been talking a little bit about legislative remedies for the kinds of undermining of democracy, uh, judicial lines that you've been talking about. So, do you think that? I, I believe this is the law that's also known as HR one. So, I think some parts of HR one would be upheld. So, the Constitution says that Congress may regulate the times, places, and manners of um of holding elections and what the supreme one thing that the supreme court has said is that voter qualifications are not time place or manner so like congress cannot tell the state you have to allow this person that you don't want to be able to vote to vote and so i think it's likely that the supreme court would strike and there's a provision of hr1 for example that says that uh, people with felony convictions need to be reenfranchised. I think that's likely to be struck down because the Supreme Court would say that's not time, place, or manner. I could see the Supreme Court saying, like, well, you you can't, you can't, Congress can't ban voter ID laws because the state has decided that people without ID shouldn't be allowed allowed to vote. Um, now, the most important provision of of the uh, of HR one is the anti-gerrymandering provisions, the provisions requiring independent um, requiring in, independent commissions to draw districts. And I honestly don't know what's going to happen there. And, you, you know, I mean, like the thing that disturbs me most about the Supreme Court, maybe this is a good place for me to end, you know, I guess, God, this would have been 12 years ago. I, I was working as a policy analyst at the Center for American Progress. And, you know, a name that you that you all may have heard recently, Nira Tandon. I, I heard <laughs> that, like, Nira was looking for someone to write a brief in what became the first Obamacare case that went up to the Supreme Court. And, you know, I just thought this would be a good career opportunity for me. So I poked my head in her office. I said, you know, hey, Nira, I'm, I hear you're looking for someone to write this brief. I can do it. And, 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 and you know, we started talking. And at one point I said to her again, this was what became NFIB v. Sebelius, the big major attack on Obamacare. And at one point I said to her, you know, Nira, like, I, I'm thrilled to do this. You know, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Do you really think it's necessary? Like, this is a silly legal theory. No one's going to take it seriously. And yeah, yeah, I was wrong about that. Um, and like, you know, I didn't think anyone would take Hobby Lobby seriously for a while because right. before Hobby Lobby, you know, the controlling case was United States v. Lee, which said that when a business enters into the commercial sphere, sphere, it has to follow the same laws as everyone else. And I just thought they would follow United States v. Lee. I, I was wrong about that. You know, I, I mentioned this crazy judge who said that um, evicting someone is not economic activity. I mean, I don't want to dwell too much on that. But the reason I bring it up is because these guys are coming up with new and increasingly bizarre ways to interpret the law much faster than I can anticipate or anyone else can anticipate what new bizarre theory they're going to come up with. And so... I mean, if you asked me to come up with a legal argument for why um, federally imposed redistricting commissions are unconstitutional, like I'd have to spend a lot of time thinking about what that argument is. Yeah. But these guys don't need a good argument. They just need an excuse. And they just need the votes, right? Yeah. And someone's going to give them an argument that they're going to say that someone could very easily give them an argument. They would say, that's good enough for me. I can put that in opinion. Well, um, Ian, you've given us lots of reasons to stay up all night. Or if I'm looking at the comments, uh, lots of people are going to go straight to the bottle. Um, But it's important (laughs) to tell the truth always. Thank you for the unblinking honesty and taking us through this very important issue, um, even if it scares us. Thanks so much. It's a lot of fun. It's wonderful to see you around.
Yeah, my thanks to both of you on behalf of the stream. On behalf of the stream, uh, Erin, Ian, that was a fascinating and sometimes horrifying conversation, <laughs> but like, thoroughly enjoyable. Thank you so much, and thank you to our audience for spending your evening with us. If you have yet to purchase a copy of the agenda, you can click on the green button center of your screen, and it'll come with a signed book plate. And on that note, thank you, everyone, and have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye, the book. <laughs>